our June uh, breakfast go really low in, in uh, popularity because everybody's gone to the beach. Um, so we really appreciate you being here. I'm Susie Jeanette. I'm CEO of Mambo Media. I'm also an instructor here at CEPI. Um, I am part of the Digital Marketing Strategies Certificate, um, and I see lots of familiar faces. Um, I'm thrilled about this topic and about our panelists. I'm really excited about this. It's going to be a great um, day of content for us. Um, first, I'd like to, I'm very excited to introduce our new executive director here at CEPI, Michelle Gibanasi, and she has a few things to say about the program. So let's give her a chance. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for braving the traffic, the bus, the almost rain, everything to be here bright and early this morning. We really appreciate your participation and welcome you to CEPI. How many of you have had exposure or worked with CEPI some way in the past? Steffi being the Center of Executive and Special Education. Okay, great. Well, welcome to those of you who are back, and welcome to those of you who are new to us. Just to give you an idea for those of you who haven't been here, what our center represents. We are the non-credit arm of PSU that exists to provide career development and professional education for individuals who want to build a skill set, move into a new role, gain a promotion, and also for groups of employees who need on-site or custom training. So we do classes here, and there are catalogs out front for anybody who's interested in classes. I know I've fielded a couple, fielded a couple of questions. But we also go on-site to businesses and do cohorts of trainings, whether it's leadership development, uh, process improvement, specific technical skills. We do all kinds of things for businesses to meet their needs. So this is a taste of the kinds of things that CEPI can present. We're fortunate to have a wonderful partnership with Mambo Media. Um, and they are leading you today, but this is just, just an example of the training that we provide. So if you have any questions at the end of today's session, grab one of us and we'd be happy to answer those for you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Michelle. Um, on that note, some of the courses that we are offering um, coming up, and one that I'm really excited about is our PR and Media Relations Certificate. That starts in September. Um, not only do we focus on overall PR and media relations strategies, but then we get do a deep dive into crisis communication, new media, and how social media is impacting PR. Um, so if you're thinking about a career in PR or you're in PR and you want to really um, develop those skills, uh, that's starting September 26th. And please take a look at it or talk to me or Melissa in the back of the room. Um, and then we have our digital marketing strategies certificate starting September 9th. Um, I kicked that off with Intro to Digital Strategies. It's a, um, mine is a three-week course, um, giving you a broad overview of social media, search, uh, web, uh, conversion, and then analytics. Um, and then we move into content strategy, and then social media, and then we, we cap it off with a, a capstone-like project. Right now, our cohort this year is presenting, is doing, um, developing a marketing strategy for uh, Mercy Corps, and we'll be presenting to them in a couple of weeks, so that's very exciting. Yeah, so please, if you have any questions after um, our presentation, I'm happy to stay later, and then I also have Jana here. Jana is a former uh, graduate of the DMS program, um, and she can answer any questions about the classes as well. As well as Melissa, can you raise your hand? Melissa Endicott is also a program manager so any of us can answer questions for you. Okay, without further ado, I'm so excited to announce our panel. Um, we have Lori White. Uh, she is with Machine Research. Um, Lori has a pro prolific career in digital marketing, and today is going to be talking about email marketing, but really um, has, has gone all the way up the marketing maturity curve, uh, leveraging marketing automation um, and email and social to, to bring companies to um, very high top line revenue and lead generation. So it's going to be very exciting to talk to her. And then we have Jim Plymel. He is a serial entrepreneur here in Portland. Um, he is now working with the Heritage School of Interior Design. Amazing school. If you haven't seen that, please check it out. Um, if you have any uh, interest or passion in interior design, uh, it is fantastic. And um, he's helping with that company as well as some others. So he's going to share some, some findings from Heritage. And then last we have Jim McPhee, John McPhee, who is also, you, you've been in the area for 15, yeah, 20 um, years? Agency-wide, about 12 years yeah. or so, but in the digital marketing realm here in Portland for about 13, 14 years. Yeah, now with the Oregonian, um, and, but really uh, just had his hand in, in, in from search to email to all, all aspects of digital marketing. 
So you really have a powerhouse panel here. Um, we're going to do about 10 to 15 minute presentations for each and then a Q&A at the end. Um, if you're really stumped about something that one of the presenters are saying, can I say that they can raise their hand and ask you in the middle of it just so there's context? But otherwise, let's save our questions for the end um, and we'll do a Q&A <coughs> right. Okay, so first up, we're going to have Lori White. And then we decided that we really needed to re 
architect the product a little bit and instead of offering a 30 day free trial that we were going to offer a free, a free for life version of this. And then we redesigned the product to be more intuitive and more feature rich and really hone in on more of the quoting um, side of the business, not just the CAD software translation. And then we decided also that we needed to create a new marketing technology <coughs> Research, um, we, we learned a lot from our research. Um, one of the best things that came out of it was a clear list of what people actually needed in the market and what they would pay for and where their pain points were. This is just a quick summary of some of that. We also created our personas. So we learned that there are three people in the machine shops that we really needed to target. One was the owner, one was the sales manager, and one was the estimator. Each one of those We also knew that there were some other people that influenced this, but these were the three <coughs> primary people that we decided that we were going to target. Behind each persona, we have a, a detailed list of what their pain points are, um, what how our software handles some of those um, their issues, and, and really zoomed in on kind of the details of what <coughs> we were going to communicate to them, what they would care about. We also created a new re revenue strategy. <coughs> And then from there, you don't see the numbers behind us, but we have revenue goals. So it's important because Jim takes this and it goes out to get funding. It gives us the model that will either prove or disprove, and it kind of proves to the market that we can do this. So um, our marketing strategy to back up the revenue strategy then is that we're going to increase these paid programs, drive up our page views. Um, we're going to be doing our premium product and new messaging. So this is where we're going back to the personas. We're saying, who is it that's coming to our website and putting messaging that's specific to them to get them to want to use or to download that trial or the premium version? Um, next, we're going to start emailing them, but we switched over from using MailChimp to using a marketing automation application called Autopilot. We're a startup company, we don't have the budget for the HubSpots and Marketos, so Autopilot is a um, new marketing automation platform that's very affordable. Um, we downloaded that. to our pilot works very well at Salesforce. And then we're just in the process of implementing an in-application messaging system called Pendo. <coughs> so once we get them into the application and they're using it, you guys have probably seen this before where you can try a new product and a little you know, pop-up message says, hey, try this. And so we'll be using that to train people, but we'll also be using that to do marketing messaging within the application. And then last, we have Salesforce um, that we'll continue to use for our sales follow-up. The thing about um, all of these applications is that they are all tied in together. And, and in Salesforce, that's where we have all of our contact information, where we really have the profiles of these people. So we know what their role is in the company. We know how many times they've used the application. Uh, we know, you know just their company demographics. Um, we can use that information in Salesforce and push it into our application via Pendo and then, of course, through Autopilot. So it syncs together. 
So autopilot, uh, new marketing automation replaced uh, MailChimp with our email engine, deep Salesforce integration, inexpensive for creating segmentation. So this is where I can go back to those personas and I can say if this person is the owner, then I'm going to put them in this thing. If they are the salesperson, they don't want, they don't have the same <coughs> issues or messaging that the owner's going to get. We're going to give them a different segment and then again the estimator. Um, you can also create workflows. So one thing that's really nice about this is we can say if a salesperson comes into our application and has used it three times and actually goes into this part of the application, then trigger that to send the salesperson an email that says, you've got somebody in your application right now using it the way you want them to, and then we can also use that to trigger a specific email message and workflow. So we're in the, and then we can also do A-B testing, which is really important, um, and then continue to look back to that problem to make sure is, is what we predicted happening happening. Um, so far using autopilot, we've had a 60% increase in our open rate on our email. Well, the, the, the bad news is, is that our click-through rate is really low. And I'll then, I mentioned that, um, I'll get into that in a minute. Pendo, we're just um, beginning to implement this. Pendo is kind of like a Google Analytics of your website, so you actually get the analytics of people in your application. So it's very helpful for us to know who's using it, how they're using it, um, are they using it the way we want, and we can kind of tell <coughs> them if they are going off the rails. It also syncs with Salesforce, which is really nice. So we know not just the name of the person using it, but what their role is. Um, you can create guided journeys to promote features, but you can also say things um, that basically those value propositions and messaging, pull those in and, and push that out to people too. That was one of the things we found in our research is that they didn't understand that this product could do what we said. In fact, they even said in the research, if machine research were to create a software product that could do all the things you're saying they could do, yes, I would buy it, but they'll never be able to create that software. When in fact, we were three quarters of the way there and they just didn't know. So. Um, again, segmentation, role specific messaging reinforces value proposition. And then it works with autopilot too, so we can trigger specific email workflows. So I mentioned that our click-through rate was really low. So um, because we're a startup, we're, we haven't gotten to the point yet. It's, we're, what we've learned is that we're sending them emails and we're giving them instructions on how to use the product, but that doesn't matter to them as much. So after the third time, they've probably figured out, which is why the open rates are dropping off. So one of the things that the, our next venture of using Autopilot and Pendo is taking that messaging and going back and rewriting all of our emails. And one of the things that we've learned and I learned through my previous um, work with other companies is that if you don't give them meaningful content, they're not going to open it. And that's no different than the rest of us. We don't open emails if we know that I don't like this company <coughs> or I'm spamming you. So give them meaningful content, but go back to your personas because that's going to tell you what their pain points are and you'll then uh, get higher open rates. Um, has anybody heard of WeWork? The, so if, if anybody is on their email marketing, they do a really good job of email marketing. I get tons of email. I actually open theirs and I read it. Hmm. And one of the things that I noticed is that <coughs> I was getting one every day, and it was too much for me, and it was a lot of it was repeated content. But at the end of their emails, they have um, set your email preferences. So you can go in there and you can actually say, I want it daily or I want it weekly. There's other um, marketing automation <coughs> programs like Acton that actually allow you to say what type of content you want. Um, so that's one thing that, that's where the technology is going. I highly recommend that you dive into that. It's often something that marketers leave off because you think it's more work, but it, it, it does work. <coughs> it also builds trust, by the way. You're sending them information that they don't want. Um, you're not on their radar. On the other hand, if you're giving them meaningful information, they begin to trust you. Personalization really works. So this is one thing. I, I'll kind of go off machine research, but um, I worked at clinicians for a number of years, and we marketed to physical therapy practices. So these are physical therapists who own practices. They don't. They're not in email. They're visiting your you know, patients all day. Um, we started trying to get our open rates to increase, and we, we, so using Marketo at the time, we personalized email in the subject line. So we'd say, Lori, did you know 
our open rates doubled just by putting their name in the subject line. Um, pulling, this is a somewhat of an example, but there, when you've got your preferences and what their content is, and you can pull that content into your um, email, it works tremendously. Um, the other thing, and this was, we, we put a picture of the salesperson, and it, that surprised me more than anything, because these people really believed that Morgan was sending them an email, and they felt compelled to reply to her. So that was a, um, a one of our big learnings. <coughs> For some reason, nobody does that when you put my picture. I'm going to try to keep picture. On or the <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Try to different. I'll put Stephanie's picture. <laughs> um, the shorter emails usually perform better. This is kind of common sense, but if you have a lot of text and a lot of times marketers want to tell you everything all at once, they don't perform as much uh, or as well. Pictures paint a thousand words. Um, and sometimes your pictures don't have to be literal. That was the other thing we get often kind of get hung up on. But this email is, I left it up here as an example because besides words, it doesn't have a picture. And they could have easily put a picture of, you know, this keynote speaker who's one of the industry thought leaders. And that's going to compel me to want to know more about it. Um, multiple calls to action, that's another thing that makes a, a big difference. So. She has a call to action right here, but she could have had a registration <coughs> button down here, um, a link from the photo or something. But when you have multiple links, it absolutely improves your click-through rate. Um, and then just continue to keep testing. We found things sometimes by accident where an email was supposed to go out on Thursday and it didn't go out until Friday, and lo and behold, we found out that Fridays we had the best open rates. And, it's, and I think it's, I think open rates, um, depend on your audience. That, and they say Tuesdays and Wednesdays are the best days to send emails. Has anybody noticed on Tuesday that your email blows up? You just, I, I, the data still says Tuesday and, and Wednesday have the highest open rates, but I think it depends on, this is where you have to go back to those personas and know your audience, because I think the physical therapists were opening it up because Fridays are kind of their days to get caught up. We also sent one out on a Saturday and it had even higher open rates. So test, test, test. We find for executive level marketing, Sundays are very effective. Are because they? they're kind of looking at their week, you know, Sunday afternoon, and they're, that's the time that they can actually deliberately read rather than just opening and closing and putting it in the trash. Yeah, it's just different for every industry. So, um, so some of the takeaways, I recommend going back and setting those funnel goals because ultimately it kind of gives your email marketing a purpose and makes sure that your email and your marketing strategy is aligned with your revenue goals. Again, build trust with your audience. Know what they care about. Um, sometimes you think you know because you've been doing it for a while and you know your market, but you'd be surprised what you don't know and take the time to find out. Um, know their, their pain points and map your solutions back to their pain points. When you talk about them and what they care about, build that trust, you're going to get a higher engagement rate. Test, test, test. You can't, even when you know something, test it three or four months later. Um, subject lines, we, one thing that we did at um, my previous company was we would have contests. And so I'm, I was a little wary of this, but we'd have contests in the marketing department and we'd say um, to the marketers, give us your email subject lines. And so we would A, B, C, D test for subject lines. Some of these subject lines, I'm like, we are <laughs> and guess what? They performed the best. So <laughs> it's, uh, and you can have fun with it. We did. We had contests, and every week um, you get a lot of creative ideas there. Um, your templates, that's where, test your templates too. Um, some of the email marketing templates I found, you know, have a photo, and they weren't performing as well as the simple text ones. So, and again, on your message, um, test your messaging. Words make a difference sometimes, just so you don't have to say everything, say a little bit to get them to want to click through and learn more. And again, the personalization. Um, you can do a lot of personalizing now with marketing automation applications. Um, I recommend that you don't just solely depend on email. Use it in conjunction with other channels. So in our case, we're going to be using Pendo quite a bit. Um, we're actually even looking at using direct mail, um, going back old school to you know, get some of those owners of something. Um, just continue.
continue to use it with other channels. And then last, just always, I'm a big data person, go back to your data. Your data will always tell you where you are failing and where you need to focus and put your attention. So go back to your funnel, look at those conversion rates, look at your open rates, your click-through rates. And then make sure that, again, it's, it's syncing with your revenue. So you can have high open rates, but if your click-through rate is, isn't working and your offers aren't working, then you need to go back and just continually readjust with that. And then communicate results. So this is um, one thing that Jim always is, he's CEO, he's like, you're doing great work, but I don't know how. So there's always one more email you got to get done tomorrow. So go mm -hmm. take the time, and now the marketing automation systems have really great um, uh, visuals and funnels that executives can really absorb and people can share that. And people want to know that. So like what I was saying about using the contest as the, um, the email subject line, the rest of the company thought that was great. They really wanted to know more about that. They wanted to see the four that we did and how they performed. And it's really important to take that time and, and kind of share that information. And that's it. secret of how you become a CEO is by taking credit for the work that other people do. <laughs> so, um, and that's actually what I'm going to do today for you guys. And so, uh, you probably remember me from America's Worst Designers on HGTV. <laughs> that's me. Yeah, I was the American design disaster. Uh, but I, um, I had the, the great fortune of having the chance um, in between the last company that I started clinician and the company that I'm currently working for, Machine Research, to work with my wife and a, a bunch of other really beautiful people to start a company or to start a school, um, really to reimagine a school called Heritage School of Interior Design. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I did? There we go. Okay, so Heritage um, is a a uh, school that was started 20 years ago, but it was reimagined in 2015. Um, and really, when you think about how you want to change something, um, you, you really want to start from what's important to you and, what, and who you want to attract to be on this journey with you. Um, and so one of the things that we did was the first thing was we went out and got the school accredited. Um, but we focused on what the values of the school were. What, what was it that we wanted to cause out there? And the reason I'm telling you is this is important because it has to show up in your communication. Because think about something. If, if you're bored when you're writing an email, what do you think is going to happen to the person who receives that email? You think they're going to go, wow, this is great stuff. <laughs> they're not going to do that. So what you need to do is you need to focus on what you know is going to be important to you and what's going to be important to your audience. I, I was reading something on LinkedIn recently, and a person was saying, look, I got this email, and it was all about the salesperson. There was nothing about me in this email. And I'm like, this is not marketing. This is not selling. Stop doing this. And if you look at a lot of the emails you get, they're about things that, why would anybody care about that? It's about the person's agenda that's trying to sell you something. So, Focus on what your values are and what's going to attract somebody. And that's really what we did. We said, okay, and I say we, but it was really Stephanie and Amy who are sitting over there, and I have their pictures here. And when you send out an email with their pictures in it, you get a much higher open rate. So, um, but what, what we were doing was looking for people that were passionate about interior design and were looking to get the technical and business skills and, and wanted to do that in a way that they weren't having to go to, you know, four years of school and get $100,000 worth of debt. So really, that was the, the approach behind this. And so we felt like we had something really unique to offer. Now, this is what it looked like back in the day. So, you know, you look at this, um, and this is what it looks like today. So we're, we're trying to really simplify and streamline the message and get out there with what are we, what's the message that we're trying to deliver. The, the good thing about that is a simple message that appeals to people really works. And we're going to talk about that in the email side, but um, I stole this funnel from Lori, um, but 
One of the things I want to say about email is that email is really most effective once you have a relationship with somebody. It's not really a great tool to establish relationships with people. So when you look at the top of the funnel here, you want to map out what do you expect buyers to do. And, and at Heritage, what we're really trying to do is get people circling the airport, right? Um, we don't expect them to jump right from, hey, um, I heard about this um, interior design school and I'm signing up the next day. What we want them to do is be engaged, be in orbit. And so the first thing we want them to do is explore. And so the, in the beginning, we want to drive about 10,000 people to, um, to somehow engage with us. Your website is what's going to do that, but really it's not your website. It's something, somebody's going to search for something. They're making a career change. You've got to think about what are they doing, what are they thinking about, and then what you want to do is stand out in a crowded market, right? Um, landing pages, I don't even really think websites are as important now as where people land after they do that search, right? So is what they clicked on and what they said they were interested relevant into where they land and the content that they see on the website? So the other thing is, how do you do that? You, you have to have a bunch of content that you create that ultimately drives all of that search out there. So this is where Amy and Stephanie have just been fantastic. Um, they, because they're so passionate about what they do, they write about things that people are interested in. And that is really the content that's behind there, and that's what drives people to the website. So you see a story, you see something that interests you, you go there, and now you land, and now you're stuck in orbit at that point, right? So then the next thing is, once I get you in orbit, the next thing I want you to do is raise your hand and get and connect, right? Um, that's where the email newsletter, now the great thing about the e email newsletter is there's almost no original content in there. It's the same content we were using for SEO, but we've repurposed it, we've editorialized it, and we've put that out there in an email. I say we, but they do it. I don't do anything. I'm just taking credit. I write books about that. Okay, so what, now you're going to get them to connect, and you're looking for people that connect with your values, connect with your message, and then get them to apply. That's our next thing. Then we want to get them to commit. Is this sounding like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? Awareness, interest, decision, action. Have you made your decision? We want to make you to make your decision. So we have you fill out a form. It goes into our CRM system, and then you get on the drip campaign. Sounds painful, right? We're going we're gonna to hit you with things. Yeah, that's exactly right. It can be a Chinese water torture, or it could be something that's really exciting. And that's what Amy and Stephanie do. They put these things out that really get people excited, and I'm going to show you that. And then the last thing we want people to do is we want to expand our sales force. We want to get people to share our message with other people. So we also have a part of what we're doing that is getting people to tell our message for us and invite other people to get in orbit to start circling the airport so that we can land those planes. And so you see we have a goal, and our goal is to get 50 people to register, but it starts with 10,000 people. But what we're doing is we're constantly getting people in there, and we're creating a relationship with them through content, and then how we get that content out there through email. So the good news is the plan worked. Um, they did a great job putting content out there. You look at how many people we had on our website. The thing that was most impressive to me was they spent three minutes on there. You look at bounce rate, very few people. You, know, you get some percentage of the people say, well, this wasn't what I was looking for. I was actually looking for America's worst designers, and he's not there. But instead, they, they come here, and you can see they're finding what they want. They're spending time on the website. Um, the other thing that's really awesome about what um, Stephanie and Amy have done is we don't pay for any of our search results. And in all my companies, I have to spend money to get people to actually come and look at the content that we've created. They're not doing that at all. They're organic search. They're coming up where they were before, before they implemented the content strategy. They're on the second page of the search results. Now, if you, um, if you Google interior design schools in Portland, here you see Heritage right up there with, um, with the other schools that are out there. So fantastic job on that. So here's the point. With email, what you're really doing is you, you want to know what's the goal. What do you want to do? So we have our goals is we want to make a connection, we want to call people to action, and we want to get people to engage in referring us and getting other people. We want to expand our sales force, right? So if you look at what happened here, they tell a human interest story. And this is what they found through experimenting, that people like to be able to see themselves going to interior design school. That goes back to the persona, right? So you want to know that there are different people that have different reasons and motivations. Um, and then the next thing is, hey, we happen to have these courses 
that are going on. So you hear this story about Julie who came from Canada, and then you see the courses, which is action, right? We want you to take action. Um, and then we have this heritage alumni, so we put something in there for the people that we want to sell for us as well. Um, and then here's another great one. I, and this is, this is one of the things that I'm, that I'm really passionate about now, is that I believe that customer success is the new sales. Why am I saying that? The, the reason is, it used to be that a salesperson convinced you to do something. How often does a salesperson convince you to do something now? Think about it. It never happens now. So what you want to do is you want to find people who are like the people that you want to be buying from you, and you want to promote their success, and you want to make people successful. And this is an example of that. They're promoting the success of one of their designers that really did, in their life, have the courage to change course, which is one of their values. And they focused that on people that were coming into the new year and would want to start, and then got 353 views of a story on, uh, on this person, Kristen. So a great example of starting from a value, putting out something interesting, finding somebody who's in that persona that you're looking for, drawing them in, and again, getting them in orbit. Now here's another one. So the, another thing that you've got to do is you've got people circling the airport, but why are they not committing? Why are they not making the decision? Um, so we looked at what were the things that were preventing them, and this is a newsletter that announces the online um, courses that we're offering. And so we knew that one of the things was about having flexibility. So now you're, you're sending an email out to a specific group of people. These are people that raised their hand and said, I'm interested, but then they never made a decision to fill out the application form. So now we can target them and, and say, okay, what's going on and why aren't, they, why aren't we overcoming the objections? So again, specific purpose, driving content, get people to make decisions. Another thing is, and this is how you integrate social into this is, you want to um, engage your thought leaders. You want to engage people that, that are out there and are that share your message. And here's an example of what they did um, with Jana, who's a social media star on Instagram. They used her to go out and promote, and then again, we're just trying to use all of these megaphones out there to get people to connect. And then ultimately, looking at how could you use your blog and then putting your blog out there. Don't just look at email, but also look at social media and putting your blogs out there in social media. The main thing in Twitter is nobody cares what you had for breakfast this morning, right? They want to know that you have some valuable content. So what you do is you go out on Twitter and you say, here's something really interesting that's going on. Get people to do it and then push them through to your content that's on your, that's on your website or on your blog. Unless you're tweeting about our pastry. Okay. Yeah, we do care about that. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the great news is, again, um, Stephanie and Amy have done a fantastic job. They went from no social media presence to getting 457 people to like them on Facebook, a bunch of Instagram followers. And if you go out there and you look at all the pictures they have, you can see that they're going to attract the kind of people that are really interested in what they're doing. So again, that passion drives that content, that content <coughs> drives interest, that interest drives decisions, actions, and ultimately customers for you, which is what um, you're after on this. So this is what I would encourage everybody is that when you make investments in these things, it really, it's, it's really about having that integrated content strategy. And when I say integrated, it goes all the way back to What's important? What do people value? What do you want to say that anybody's going to care about out there? And then, and then offer that. Make sure that you've got a content strategy that drives it out through your website, that drives that out through all of your different channels. And then email is just another way of getting that information out there. And think of the specific purpose of that. Five phone calls. Oh. So you've only gotten five phone calls? No, before. Oh. Before we, in, we implemented the content strategy, we'd only had five phone calls. Since implementing that, we've had over 100 student inquiries. Um, and then we exceeded our first year registration goals by 25%. Um, and the pipeline right now, we're, we're already oversubscribed for the upcoming fall term um, with this. And so this is starting from zero. And again, I, I attribute that to really great content that has driven you know, all of this search and getting all of the people circling the airport and building a relationship with these people and then finding ways to constantly connect with them. Um, and so that's really what's, and then you also learn a lot about what you need to do with your product. So they've, 
added new classes and offerings, and so it just becomes a virtuous cycle of, of improvement there. So the integrated content, content strategy and investing in that is really what's driven the growth. The big challenge is when you're going to do this, um, you've got to have you got to have regular frequency um, and not too much, right? So it's about finding that balance. Lori talked about this. What is too much and what's not enough? Um, and, and that goes for your social media as well as your email. And, and that is um, where you've got to have a dedicated resource. You have to have somebody that wakes up and cares about and thinks about these things. Like if you would have hired me to do this stuff for, you know, for social media, for interior design, I mean, it really wouldn't have gone very well for you. It would have been a very bad experience for you because I would have started talking about 3D models and transforming those into machines and nobody would have cared. But what, what you have to focus on is you ultimately are looking for new and fresh and exciting things that are going to attract people and creating more of those, po what PWAM up there is positive word of mouth. What's going to get the buzz going? What's going to get people talking about you? And that's really, to me, that's kind of the new PR. You're looking for... Um, creating more people out there to sell for you. But focus on having a dedicated resource that wakes up and all they think about is how am I going to get people to care about what we care about today um, because I understand what they care about. That's, that's, and, and that's what I think they've done a really good job with. So that's it. Thanks. So I want to start off, uh, Jim made a really good point about how email marketing is really best utilized once you've established a relationship with somebody they've been to your site, they signed up, right? I want to talk today about the other side of that where there's technology out there today um, that you can use email marketing as a lead acquisition strategy. Uh, so I'm going to come at it from a little bit, little bit different perspective. Um, it's my teaser. Now you get to see me, my, my mother. Um, Susie already kind of talked about it, but I've been a digital marketer since 03. I'm the uh, director of SEO and social for the Oregon Media Group. Been at a, several agencies over the past 11, 12 years. Um, set on the SEM PDX board of directors for a couple of years as well. And in the agency world, I've pretty much done everything from, you know, pulling the, the levers and pushing the buttons all the way to sales, which is what I'm doing now. Um, so, just a few quick stats, hopefully this won't bore you, but um, as I was kind of going through this presentation, thinking about how I wanted to approach it, it's like, the amount of emails we all get now is really staggering, right? So, just some quick numbers, we're expected to hit about 5.2 billion email accounts by 2018. And if you focus just on the business sector, um, the amount of emails that are going to be generated are about 139 million, or that's the expectation in 2018, and that's just business, no personal emails or anything. Um, the average person gets about 121 emails per day. This is about accurate to everybody. <laughs> Relatively close, and we're expected to hit about 140 uh, by 2018. So there's a lot of noise out there, right? Emails are flying at us, whether it's business or whether it's personal. And so we've got a lot of clutter that we have to go through. And so email marketing, um, you need to be smart about how you're utilizing email marketing, whether it's subject lines, great content, um, making sure you've got acquisition strategies, whether it be SEO, paid search, to get people to your website so they can sign up and then you can continue that conversation. Um, excuse all the text here, but just um, I want you all to know email marketing isn't dead. So if you're not utilizing email marketing, definitely consider doing it. Um, the staggering thing to me here is 33% of uh, open emails occurred on an iPhone, right? So at heart, I'm a search guy, SEO, paid search. Um, and so 2015, last year, was a really big year for me personally. Uh, mobile search surpassed desktop search, and I shed a little bit of a tear because mobile's finally here, right? <laughs> um, we've, been, we've, been saying that, we've been saying that for the past five, eight years. Mobile's coming, this is the year in 2015, I think it finally happened. But um, Gmail uh, on desktop uh, was 15% of email opens. And so if you think about it, iPhone, mobile, 33%. If you think, I see everybody's devices sitting in front of them, we're always checking our email VR. <coughs> And so I'll, I'll touch on this later, but just uh, one thing, you know, as you're going through your email marketing strategy, you have to have a responsive, mobile-friendly website and landing pages, right? Because a lot of people are checking their email from their mobile devices, and if you're taking them to a non-mobile-friendly website, you're pretty much shooting yourself in the foot. You're going to lose that customer, and you're wasting a ton of money. 
Um, 89% of marketers say that email is the primary channel for lead generation. So that to me was a little bit surprising, which is why I included it in here, because my, my thought of email was what Jim had mentioned. It, it's more of a, a, a way to continue that conversation. And it hasn't been used as a, a huge lead acquisition strategy. Um, but if you think of it from the flip side, it can be as long as you're doing the great content, as long as you have good SEO, you've got a great paid search campaign, and you're really able to find that highly targeted audience, get them to your site, um, and then you can utilize email marketing to kind of continue that messaging or that conversation. Um, people want emails, right? So the third bullet point of those that have opted in, 95% uh, say that they find the messages useful or somewhat useful. So that's a good thing. I mean, it's kind of somewhat useful isn't it? a great great way to describe your email marketing, but if you're creating really solid content in your uh, email messaging and people are, you know, you're providing them value, bring them to your site, you can kind of continue that conversation. 61% um, of consumers like to receive weekly promotional emails and 28% want them more frequently. So these are people who have come and actively said, yes, I want to subscribe to you. I'm interested in your brand or your business or your content. Um, so make sure you have a consistent strategy. I see a lot of clients where they will, yep, we do email marketing and we dig into it and they've done three email marketing campaigns in the last year, right? That can, lack of consistency is, you wanna teach people, like, you know, try and be consistent on um, the days you put your email marketing out and, and as Michelle had mentioned, you wanna test, absolutely, there are certain days that work better than others depending on your audience, so test all that out, but then once you figure out what's working, make sure you're doing it consistently. 20% um, of marketers can directly link um, email to the primary source of revenue. So one-fifth of the pie, right? Email can be a huge revenue generator. They're already familiar with your brand and your company and your products or services. Um, continue that conversation. Get them back. Try and upsell them other products or services. Um, marketers who use personalization in their subject lines see 26% more opens. Um, kind of a no-brainer here. You always want to be testing your subject lines, see what works. But the more personalized you can make it, the more relevant you can make it to your, your clients or your customers, um, the higher open rates you're going to have and the higher successes you'll see. Um, and then video, um, adding video to email can increase click rates by 300%. So um, I think that just sort of speaks to don't just have plain text in your email messages. Um, you want to vary it up by utilizing imagery, video, um, along with um, so one thing I think we all need to think about is just, you know, be smarter with our email. Um, we've touched on a lot of these already, um, so I'll kind of run through this quickly, but uh, mobile optimized landing pages or mobile optimized website, just to make sure that if people are checking from their mobile devices that they have a good user experience. Um, segmenting your email database. So this is something that I don't see very often and it kind of baffles me. It's um, have the ability to be able to segment your, your email database. So whether it's by you know, demographic information, uh, vertical or industry information, or whatever it might be that makes sense for your business, make sure you're able to segment out that, that all those people into different email buckets, so then you can message them with the appropriate subject line and the appropriate content. You're gonna see much better success because if you think about it, those messages are then more highly relevant to that particular user group. Um, I just touched on the types of content. So content marketing has you know, been the big buzzword over the last couple of years, and I think it's going to continue to be. As Google gets smarter and smarter with their search algorithms, they can read content more effectively, and you don't have to keyword stuff like we used to. Um, creating valuable content that you can push out to social channels can help drive loyalty, and obviously lead generation as well. And so making great content is sort of the engine that's going to drive everything. It's going to drive website traffic, going to drive leads, and then that allows you to then utilize your marketing or email marketing strategies. Um, Google Analytics, so if you're not, it's been touched on by Jim and Michelle, if you're not utilizing Google Analytics to actually review and test your data, um, that's a problem, right? If you're not UTM tagging everything so you can see email campaign by campaign and the performance of it so you can kind of learn from what you were doing previously and how you can get better, then uh, you're probably missing out on a huge opportunity to drive higher click-through rates, drive higher revenue, and so on. Um, and then test, test, and, and test some more. I think it's always an ongoing thing where we as marketers, we've got access to so many tools and everything in the online world is essentially trackable. Uh, if we're not utilizing the tools that we have at our disposal, you're not learning and you're not improving your overall marketing strategies and communication. Okay, so getting into sort of this whole 
technological aspect of, of email marketing where it's basically a, a targeted email plus a multi-channel display type operation, I guess I'll call it. Um, it's the ability to, so keep in mind, this is um, all of what I'm gonna talk about. <coughs> not pushing products. I want to state that. I, I do work for the organizing group. We do sell this, but this is I'm only presenting on it today because A, it's relevant, and it's also just a different twist on email marketing because I'm using or talking about it more as a lead acquisition strategy than sort of a, um, a customer yeah. retention or nurturing strategy. Um, so this is, has to do with rented email lists, right? So when we talk about email marketing, generally it's somebody coming to your own website saying, yes, I want to sign up for your newsletter, and then they get your you know, your monthly or weekly newsletters. So this is renting highly targeted lists that you then send emails out to. Um, you know, I'll get into the kind of targeting and audiences that you can break this down by in a second. Um, but it's a basically an email campaign. If someone clicks on the email or not, as long as it's delivered to their inbox successfully, you can then utilize a remarketing strategy across the network using display or banner ads um, to then continue that conversation and get them back to your website. And so. Um, these people may not be familiar with your brand, right? So that whole remessaging component is crucial in trying to drive brand awareness and then get them back to your site to hopefully convert them into a, a customer. Um, the really cool thing I, I believe about this is, um, you know, as I just kind of mentioned, it's, it's pretty easy from a digital aspect to track everything we do and figure out what's working, what's not. It is hard sometimes to really understand ROI even with digital, what actual channel is driving the revenue for you. So um, the really cool thing about this is you can do a data match back with a point of sale system. So if you're at a business where you uh, collect uh, this, this data, uh, we can match it back to, okay, here's all the people that purchased a product from you, and we can match it back to the email list that was originally sent out um, and determine true ROI. This person was on the email list, and they we know that they actually came Um, so the unique data set, so where does the email list come from? Um, they come from over 20,000 different websites that obviously have email sign-up forms. It's completely 100% opt-in. Um, you must be 18 or over uh, in order for your name to be on this list. Um, and the really cool thing is this data is uh, updated in real time. And so I think rented lists in the past, have, or even in the present, have gotten a really bad rap because the data and the emails can be really old, right? Up to two, three, four years old. And so Say you're trying to um, target somebody to buy a car. Well, two years ago, they might have been in the market to buy a car, but if I'm buying that list now, they probably have already purchased a car at that point, and now you're sending an email out to someone who really couldn't care because they, they're happy with their new vehicle. Um, and so the data being updated constantly, and, and the data is updated constantly by um, kind of declared type data. So if I go to a website and sign up for something, um, and I input information about myself in that website, um, and I say, yes, I want to opt into this email list. Um, as you're going about the internet, uh, clicking on articles, clicking on ads, doing you know your business online, um, this data shifts and updates constantly. So if one day I'm in kind of this auto, I have interest in auto because I'm reading um, articles about you know the, the newest car that's coming out, or, you know maybe it's a Tesla or whatever. Um, you know, two months down the road. I'm not, I haven't touched any auto-related articles, and now I'm reading you know, real estate type articles. I'm gonna shift from an auto intender or having an auto interest over to a real estate intender or real estate interest. So with the data constantly being updated, you're pretty much guaranteed to always find that person at the right moment. So as you, if you wanna buy a list for real estate intenders, the people in that list are gonna have actual real estate intender interest, which I think sets obviously apart from just the general rented list that you get that are, are much older. Uh, audience propensities. So there's over 500 different audience segments that you can target, um, and I'll go over a few in a second. Um, you know, what, we can look at the SIC code. So if you want to be very specific in a vertical or a business category, um, you can choose that. There's B2C, there's B2B targets, um, depending on what your business is. You can look at a lot of demographic data. Um, the interest data to me is, is the biggest key factor here. So what are people actually interested in? What sort of behaviors have they exhibited online? Um, that's the information I want because I want to find people who are highly relevant to my business and the people that I want to target. Uh, and you can get down to the geo level, even as, as specific as the zip code level. And obviously the, the more fine-tuned you, you bring that geo in, the smaller the, the list is gonna be. 
Um, but if you are, you know, you operate a, a store with a physical location where somebody would walk into it, you know, you're probably only going to want a geo of, you know, 25 to 50 miles, depending on what you're selling, because people outside of that probably aren't going to the store, and then you're wasting, wasting money. <coughs> so you can get ridiculously uh, targeted with your audience here, and so I just pulled some popular audience targets, and given that we're located here in Portland, I just pulled um, some different areas around the, the full state of Oregon. Um, list count of there's over 511,000 people within that email list if you wanted to just target all of Oregon. Um, you can see the other ones here, but the cool thing is, if say I want to target all of Oregon um, for higher education, say I'm, a, you know, say I'm PSU and I wanted to, to try and find people in the state of Oregon um, that have an interest in higher education, maybe they're high school students, um, and you want to start you know, speaking with them at this point. That would be a good list to then obviously purchase and, and email these folks and you can see the different industries there. And, and there are more, but I just pulled some of the, the higher ones. With uh, technology, healthcare, higher ed, recruitment being some of the bigger ones. Appliance down here, everybody needs appliances, right? Um, so then the whole point of sale matchback system. So again, I think this is the key differentiator here where um, we have to, we look at physical mailing address and email address. And so when someone purchases something, um, from your store or online or whatever, we can take that data and then match it back to the email list and actually come up with a very specific ROI. So you know obviously what you paid for the email list and the program that was run, and then you know how many people from that email list actually purchased products, so calculating that ROI is pretty simple. Um, and I've got a couple of case studies that I can run through here. So um, one is a furniture retailer. Um, so this is a, a client out of Alabama, Florida, and they wanted to, to you know, talk to people who had interest or intent in buying furniture. Um, and their goal was to get people into the store, um, and they, they wanted to have, you know, we, we said they needed to have children. So basically we're targeting families in the Alabama, Florida area, um, trying to get them to come into the store for, us, for the sale. We ran this program for them um, using the, the propensities here of furniture at retail with you know, interest and intent to purchase. So based on the behaviors they exhibited online, they were consuming content around uh, furniture. Um, we sent out just about 247,000 emails and the impressions delivered. So these emails went out and as people were being remessaged to, it ended up being almost you know, 730,000 impressions that we generated. So driving that awareness and visibility um, that resulted in 354 sales uh, for an ROI of over 2,387%, right? So pretty easy to do that calculation and we can, we can do that direct match back. Um, and just some other higher level uh, metrics here. So over 1,500 clicks on the coupon on the site, the email open rate, 7.6%. Uh, um, and then our retargeting victory rate was uh, at 20 percent Um, and then looking at a four-year uh, state university, um, this was to target high school students, um, trying to get them interested in an honors program at a four-year public <coughs> university. Um, the campaign, we were targeting uh, parents with students in high school nearing graduation. Um, the goal is to encourage uh, campus tours and to apply for the honors program. And again, using the same um, email marketing and targeted display campaign, we ran two different flights, which you can see over here. Um, over 25,000 emails delivered, 128,000 impressions. We saw an open rate of 9.4% um, with a click, a click rate of 0.8 and we drove over 600 clicks to the client's site. And in the second, so that was a five day flight I should, I should say, and the second one was a 30 day flight. Um, so you can see that the numbers are pretty similar. Um, we ended up uh, driving 14 students um, who applied for the honors program. Um, into the university, I, if I recall, I, I wasn't on this campaign, but I want to say they were looking for like trying to get eight to ten people to apply for the honors campaign. So, from their perspective, and based on what a student is worth to them, getting 14 students to apply, you know, maybe 10 of them will actually continue on to the program. I don't know, but um, the university was ecstatic with these results just because um, they got a highly relevant audience, you know, to sign up for their honors program. So, pretty pretty easy. Um, yeah.
key things that, that were mentioned when Jim was talking, he talked about trust. And um, IDC has recently come out with a stat where by 2020, 85% of all of our relationships will be digital. So kind of take that in, okay? Already your bank relationship is digital. Most of your healthcare is digital, unfortunately, right? So if you think about your relationship with your girlfriend in Chicago is digital, <laughs> right? So, uh, sorry, my girlfriend, not if you maybe not your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> <Not gonna go. laughs> um, but if you think about that, so so when you think about relationships, though, so this is relationships. This isn't commerce per se. This is relationships. The, the the foundation of all relationships is trust, and so you have to start building trust in a digital format. And so that's the biggest challenge to marketers right now is how do I build trust in a digital format? Right? It's easy if I walk up to Lori and I'm like, Lori, how are you doing? Oh, we have kids together. We live in the same area. I'm building trust within 30 seconds of meeting her. Right? That's very different than when we have to do that digitally. So one is to look at persona pain points. Right? What, what is their pain and how can I help solve their pain? That's a great way to build trust. Not, hey, this is what I'm selling and you need to buy it because right. that immediately wipes out trust. Um, but instead, hey, I feel your pain, and I have some really great content that might answer that, might help you solve it. I'm not trying to sell you anything yet. I, I'm just trying to solve. I'm trying to say I hear you, I feel you, and that I, ha I might have some really good education that might help solve your pain. And so, in, in our marketers' world now, what we call inbound marketing, which is exactly what we're talking about, inbound marketing. We want to bring them into the website and show how we can solve their pain. Our, our key primary functions are to educate and entertain. That's it. Okay, That's that top of the funnel circling that airport that Jim talked about. We've got to educate and entertain before we can ever try to sell to somebody. Because we have to develop that, that foundational trust before we can start a real relationship with them. And so that's a really important thing as you, as you start thinking about your email marketing strategy. It's not about how am I going to sell this next guy, how am I going to convert this next guy. The stats and the tracking is really important, but you've got to build that foundational trust. So think about how you can build that foundational trust with your target audience and start with those pain points. So those personas are really important to develop. Um, and I'm not talking about personas like, oh, this is Childs and he wears purple and you know this is not superficial ad agency personas, guys. This is deep down pain. He could be good for our design school, though. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's very true. Um, but we're going to get a little deeper with child before we, we figure out, you know. Um, so we just need to, you get, need to get deep on those personas. And that, and that is the last thing I'll leave you with. Make sure you're doing that real research. And that research comes from search. What, what are the types of searches that people are doing out there that are relevant? Um, to your to the to the salt the solution that you're offering, it comes from uh, click, previous click-throughs and content that they're looking at on your website. It comes from your competitor set, guys. I know that I I'm not the only digital marketing agency that people are going to look at, right? They're going to look at all the other ones and compare. And how well am I solving those pains for you, right? Um, and and lastly, it comes from social media. The conversations that we were able to, the pains that we were able to glean for clinician in the social media sphere <coughs> helped us develop new messaging. Had we not listened to social media at all, we kind of would have been myopic in, in our approach because it was what we thought was their pain. But clearly, guys, they're telling you what their pain is out there if you're listening. So it's all available to you, and there are great agencies that can do that with you, but it's all available to you. You just need to be able to go down and get deep because you've got to build that trust. So you, that's your, the crux of your marketing problem is to figure out what their pain is and how you can build trust through education and entertainment. Be funny. Funny goes a long way. <laughs> okay, great. So thank you guys. We've got time for about 15 minutes of questions. So let's go ahead. Anybody? Yeah. Great. So I do consulting. And so a lot of the focus, not all the focus, but a lot of the focus here is kind of on the consumer end. How do you have any tips on marketing when you're talking about trying to reach someone that's kind of higher up in the, in the food chain, you know, someone that's the economic fire, someone that, at the management CEO level? Uh, you know, how do you do that? Because those kind of people also get really mad about getting emails. Uh, 
is that something where you're like, I, no, maybe that's not the right thing to do all, at all? Or I, Actually, um, I think it's the same thing. Um, so I think of the emails that I open every day. Um, and they're from people that I've developed a relationship with based on the value of the content that they're delivering. So there's a couple of things that I'd say. If you're trying to go high in the food chain, those people are looking for things that deliver results that are relevant to their job. So if you tell me, it was a great one yesterday, um, I, I loved this, and it was, um, how do you prevent from being removed as a CEO by your venture capitalist? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm all about it. <laughs> so, but, but they weren't selling me anything about them, but they were selling me on this relationship with them. And then they can pull you into an infographic of statistics of you know the, the last 20 people that have been removed for this. So it's about it's about building engaging content, which then creates trust. And then somebody will call me and say, Hey, I saw you looked at that thing that said you know about CEOs being removed. Are you afraid you're going to get fired? You know, and like yeah, actually I am. Well, you know, so you yeah. you you're looking for interesting moments, creating that engagement, and then and then um, capitalizing on those interesting moments. I sit here thinking about, you know, remember that song, I always feel like somebody's watching me? <laughs> you know, that's, and, and that's what's going on. But when, when somebody's watching you and, and you're struggling with something and then somebody comes with something that says, hey, here's something valuable that could help you with that. I noticed you're, you're afraid of this situation. Here's something that can help. That's a welcome. That, that's actually welcome to me because I'm looking for something. I'm interested in something. So it all goes back to the relevancy of the content, engagement, and then engaging at the right time. Because you, you talk about being annoyed. I'm annoyed when somebody calls and says, you know, it's the New York accent on the other end of the phone, right? Yeah. Or it's the email where somebody's talking all about themselves and their great new thing, you know, bio trust nutrition, you know, you need to have, it, it, it's like you're not even speaking to me in something that I'm caring about right then. That's where I'd start. I yeah. might also add that um, it takes a lot, there's a longer lead time, but understanding who the influencers are. So um, he's my CEO. I wanted to buy autopilot, and they came to me first. I'm going to go sell it to him. He now gets autopilot emails. I don't know if he reads them or not, but he, you know, at least he, he, he's good with autopilot. Um, when we were at Clinician, one of the things that we discovered that was a huge revelation to us, um, this is in, you know, Mark keto has got really deep analytics. We would do webinars, and um, we target the owners, who are the decision makers and the office managers, and they'd all attend these webinars. What we found was right before a deal closed, that we won a deal, the office managers were attending the webinars, and then the deal would close. And so for us, and, and sometimes the owners weren't even there. It was a huge revelation to us that it was the office manager that's running into the owner. So you think that the high level is where you need to go because they're the decision makers. But it's where does the trust live? Yep, where and does they the trust, trust their live? people. So yep. if you're winning their people over. Good managers trust their people. We right. have a similar, <laughs> we have a private jet company. So think about the elite, you know, target audience we're looking for, right? High net worth individual CEO. Um, that wants to go from San Francisco or LA to New York, right? So it's a very target audience. But we found that trying to get to he or she, uh, or to him or her, was so, was difficult. But getting to the both the assistant of that executive, who wants to make sure that their boss has a really good experience mm -hmm. traveling back and forth, right? Um, and the procurement agent. The agent, right? That, that's going to do the numbers and say, is it worth them using a private jet versus commercial and things like that, right? So having that kind of information, because the CEO isn't on the lark going to say, you know what, I want to do this. Somebody's going to do it for him, right? He, he's probably going to have his assistant go check out the best planes out there or the procurement agent. Is it okay that I do this, right? So, so there's multiple steps in a, in a high-level C-suite kind of decision. There's not only multiple influencers, there's multiple steps that they need to take to probably engage with you. And so you, you need to think about every one of those steps and how you might have the right content at the right time during the, that decision-making process. It goes back to the journey. Totally. Mapping out the journey. Funnel. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's all about the sales funnel. So you've got potentially, say it's a product manager, someone lower level. They're going to go to Google 
most likely in search because they right. don't know what they want. They've got a problem, they don't know what the solution is. And so if you've got content created, you know, very broad content at the beginning of the sales funnel. Where How to make a decision in this area. Yeah, right. something yeah. like that, with whether it's a white paper, blog post, website content, whatever it is, and then you've got along each step of the way, your content gets a little bit more specific and answers a different question. Um, and you can have this, you know, behind a closed wall, so they have to sign up to obtain this information. I suggest doing some of that so you can drive leads, obviously, but then have some of it just open for, um, you know, SEO purposes or paid search purposes okay. to talk about that. Yeah. There's a question Great. in the back. Yeah. Um, for Lori, or anyone actually, um, what were your best sources of research for your personas? What did you find to be most effective? And was any of that actually face-to-face -face conversations with your mm -hmm. He, he actually was a huge source of it because, and, and besides being a CEO, Jim is kind of a really great product marketer. So when he's having conversations with people, he's asking marketing questions. So he he's exceptionally good at that. But even after he decided this is who I think they are and what their pain points were, we hired a marketing research company to go out and validate what he thought. And, um, and that takes time. It took about, what, about three months. Um, and we learned that A, we were right about a lot of it, and then B, that there were some other things that we had overlooked, um, trends and things that were important to them that we had identified. It's, I'm a big fan of research. Yeah, the most extensive um, research is the research you don't do when you end up wasting a lot of marketing dollars um, trying to sell something to somebody who's not there um, or who doesn't care um, about what you're trying to sell. So I think that's, you know, because I, I always, while well, research is expensive and it takes too long and it's like, you need to do it. And you can get it through your salespeople. I mean, you don't have to hire a research company. You can really get it through your salespeople, but make sure when you do it with your salespeople that it's not the last person they talked to. Yeah. You know, because that's usually yeah. who it will be. Well, the deal I lost was because of this. Or the guy and let's who go develop that product. product. Yeah. 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 The big complainers tend to come through on the sales side. Yeah. You know, all the things wrong with your software or what have you. You know. You can also use SurveyMonkey too and do your own survey. That's really. Yeah. That's another. Yeah. The Pendo in-app messaging allows us to do polls, interesting. Right. so that will be really helpful. Question. Yeah, quick question um, for John. You had an awesome slide that had all sorts of statistics yeah. about email, and I would love to uh, use that to um, to convince some people. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you have sources for those numbers. Uh, come see me afterwards, and I'll. Okay. Uh, I don't know if the people get the presentations. Or yep. We do post them. We, we'll post the presentation. Okay. Okay. Were they sourced? But yeah, come, come talk to me. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank and you. John mentioned a little of this about video, and it's just like, uh, and again, with all the emails that you get, and then in the right. digital world, how uh, have you tried and used? And you know who the end, uh, the, the target market is? Video. I mean, a, a thirty-second video, and bam, you got their attention now. And then you run into that. Have you done that? Uh, we haven't, of that? we haven't, um, but the example that I used in my presentation, and I was saying a picture paints a thousand words, they had an awesome 90 second video of this event that they were promoting, and they could have easily have just put oh, yeah. that in there. And, and I think on video, too, the other thing is lo-fi is, is, you know, so really works, and by lo-fi what I mean is you make the video of yourself, but again, it's about how compelling is the story that's in there. You don't have to have a professionally produced video in order to get people engaged. Um, and just ask your kids um, <laughs> about what's going on on YouTube right now. And um, it's it's really about speaking to somebody um, where they are and, and the challenges that they're dealing with right now than it is about the professionalism of the content. I mean, professionalism is important crowd reflects your brand. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the important piece of it. So you don't want to go total cheese ball on that stuff. But you know there there is um, a place for just simple content. At Clinician, one of the things that we did was we took these like pains, and then they just recorded me talking about like for 30 seconds about a specific pain that people were having, and then directing them to something on that. And I was amazed, you know, that people. I was like, I, I don't know why anybody would want to do that, but they, you know, it was something that they were interested in. Yeah, it was super low fi I mean, it was me, and so it was like, you know, <laughs> it was like And then you can repurpose total. it, so you can use it in email, right. yeah. SEO for YouTube. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Any advice for targeting to um, individuals under 18? High schoolers specifically that are not yet 18? You mentioned 18 plus was... Um, it's for the amended email list, yeah. yeah. Um, so we worked with um, Clackamas Community College um, to recruit and then with Portland State School of Business. And so um, I, I think Jim even mentioned, or John, I think you in your presentation, um, you want to make sure that, that parents are still influencers right. at that age. Um, I, I, anybody with teenagers is going to look at me sideways, but you really are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we at least pay for things. <laughs> well, yeah, you still own the pocketbook. So I think, you know, it, it's a blend of, it, I mean, know your audience and know what you're targeting. So the parent parental message is going to be much more about their pain points having an 18-year-old, right, versus having, versus um, marketing directly to the 18-year-old. You, you've got to be hip and, and a little irreverent. And you have to be values-based. These millennials are extraordinarily values-based. So it cannot be about making the almighty dollar. Um, there needs to be something behind it, an ethos, some sort of value behind it, be it the, uh, econ uh, the, not the economy, sorry, the environment. Um, you know, look at what Bernie Sanders has done mobilizing these young folks. You know, and that, that was not, that was about ethos. Um, so remember that. It's not the traditional marketing, you know, old Coca-Cola, you hit them over the head 15 times instead of 14 times where Pepsi hit them, you're going to win. It's not like that anymore. It's too dispersed. Um, I would also be, I would look at new channels. Um, you know, Instagram, you can't beat it, Snapchat, you right. know, the, yeah. these channels, you know, whether you like it or not, and as a parent, I hate them, um, but whether you like them or not, they're highly relevant, you know, and so what can you do there? And a lot of them are offering really interesting, you know, boosts for posts and things like that, and those those make all the difference. Statistically, um, that age group is finding uh, the majority of the way they find about out about a new brand is through social media, both social... Um, Posts, but also social ads. And also influencers. Um, yeah, because for people sure. are doing content syndication through other people. Um, so, what the school does is they have these people that are being followed on Instagram and just ask them to mention yeah. um, you and, you know, maybe there's a, you know, maybe there's some reward or something that draws them yeah. in as well. But it's, it's about trust and where does influence come from. And, and I'll say too, Susie kind of hit it on the head, what I was going to say, but it's, you have two different audiences, right? So you want to drive the awareness and visibility for your brand or business to the under 18 folks and just say, oh, I, that looks pretty cool. I'm interested in that. Then they talk with their parents about it. But you also have to have that whole set other side of that strategy that is geared toward the parents, right? The cycle. Yeah, exactly. So whether that's content or whatever it might be, but you need to kind of think about it from a two-pronged approach where you're, you're targeting and driving visibility for the younger demographic, but then giving the parents enough information to make that purchase decision. And we'll get you just a second. The last thing I will say, your website has to be on point, or on fleek, as my, <laughs> really? my teenage daughter said. Um, so, so do not spend all this money on targeting, personas, email marketing, and your website blows up on that, okay? So if, you, if it's all about the kid, and the parent doesn't feel comfortable on the website, and feels marginalized, you're not gonna get that sale. And vice versa, if it's very highly clean and professional and there's no place for that 18-year-old to feel like, you get me, you, you also lose. Um, Unless you're selling reform school. Which makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But when we worked with, with the Girl Scouts, that, that same kind of thing, you needed a warm, fuzzy place for the girls to feel like, hey, you totally get me, this is modern, Girl Scouts feel so traditional, are you really cutting edge, Do I, can I be comfortable here? But the parents also need to know, are you safe? You know, are you going to take care of my kid? Do you have the right kind of, you know, uh, way of, of, of presenting to my kid that I want to be presented to? So, so that's a really, you've got a tough challenge. Um, but make sure you're holding up both sides of the bargain. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we, I mean, we, uh, my question is about how, about your thought about uh, still using the phone with the email. I mean, we, I mean, still people can commu communicate with the phone, and, and the phone is just a different form of interacting with other. How can you combine this with email in a good way that's really help you to reach out and be able to have the impression that you want? Um, so this is where marketing automation comes in that's very powerful. Um, I, as a marketer, people sell marketers because we have budget all the time. Um, I, am, I don't want to talk to a salesperson. 
but I am opening emails, I'm clicking on content, and all of that gets tracked in your marketing automation. When you use it in conjunction with your CRM system like Salesforce, you can create rules that say, if this person opens the email you know, four times or whatever your, your data is telling you that they're engaged, <coughs> you can trigger workflows that say, send the sales rep an email that says, this is a, somebody who's engaged. And lo and behold, I don't know if you've had this happen, but it's happened to me quite a bit where all of a sudden I just got done doing something digital and the phone <coughs> rang, and now I actually want to talk to that person and I'll pick up the phone and call it. And it's creepy, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It's creepy, but it works. And I'll say, too, um, going back to, I think I mentioned a couple of times in my presentation, it's a mobile optimized website. And uh, mobile optimized email templates too that allow people to call. Yeah, yeah so that is really, so many, really yeah, important. Using these, they have to be able to, if they want to call now, you've got to allow that to easily happen by click to call. So. Yeah, uh, the last thing that I will say is back to those millennials, because we do a lot of millennial marketing at Mambo. Um, they do not use the phone, they do not want to talk on the phone. I don't know if any of you feel this way, but. They do not want to have a personal interaction with you, okay? So they're they're at a hundred percent digital relationship at this point, wait, right? Because the Luddites like us are at fifty percent, so we've got to come to the middle. Um, so so you need to plan for that being the reality as we move forward. So that's why you have to, you know, what's the closest facsimile to a phone conversation that I can create? So online chat is very effective, right? Especially at at that moment of decision making. Because it allows you to do your Instagram and go back and forth between your online chat. You don't have to <laughs> stay focused on that's one right. thing like Low, a phone call. Forget trying to make them focus, right? Uh, you you got to cater to their propensities. Um, and so it's just like texting for them, you know. So they're, they're very, very adept at having these digital conversations. So I'm not saying the phone is dead. No. Um, it's certainly not with, uh, with the Xers and above. But when you get into the millennials, you, you've got to reconsider how you're going to use that phone um, and what is really valuable. So, so a, another facsimile of a, a phone call might be a webinar, for example, right? Um, so you're, you're now presenting you know, what you're doing, and it gives them the opportunity maybe to chat in, maybe not, right? So they can be the voyeurs that they want to be and not have that actual direct interaction with you. It's highly personal. The phone is extraordinarily intimate when you think about it, right? And for the kids that have been brought up on an iPad, that's not intimate. I, and so they're not looking for intimacy in an iPad. I, I mean, I, I think that there's something really important about this is that there's a, there's a, there's a time in the buy cycle where you want to remain anonymous. And what you want to do is you want to attract, you want to track those anonymous moments and then be able to connect them. This is what marketing automation does again. You want to then be able to connect them to the moment when they do reveal who they are. Um, and then look for the interesting moments beyond that when you can offer something valuable by making a phone call to them. Because the, the phone call that is there to talk about you and your needs is not the phone call that anybody wants to take. The phone call that's offered at the right time to help, oh, I see you're trying to schedule an appointment and you were struggling. I have this all the time where I can see that somebody's struggling, they're not able to log in, and if I call and reach out, they're like, I'm so glad you called. You know, they weren't going to do it because they didn't want to go look up the phone number. So they're banging their head against the wall. And I see the actions, the behavior that tells me banging head against wall. Perfect time to call. <laughs> you know, like, it's like. Good. <laughs> We've had for one more question. Anybody? Yeah. Are there any uh, personalization tools that you recommend? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there are a lot out there. Um, most of the marketing automation platforms have really good personalization. Uh, even MailChimp. It does. Yeah. yeah. I mean, especially if you can integrate it with Salesforce, because the key is to know all the information that you can get about them, like get them to answer a questionnaire in order to get something of value just to tell you about who they are. Mm -hmm. So then you can link that to their profile, and then you can start to personalize the messages based on that segmentation. There's a company in Portland that's doing this called Customer.io. Um, I just found out about them yesterday. Um, they're an they're a, uh, email personalization, um, segmentation, and deliverability company, which is really cool because they can punch through all the spam filters, which is really, really important now um, in getting through. So customer.io, autopilot, Lori talked about, MailChimp. And then if you're looking, if you look at those and they're too expensive, go to the website called Alternative 2 
and it will tell you alternatives to these things that are cheaper. That's how we found autopilot when we knew we couldn't afford Marketo. So just alternative to dot com, right? Yeah. yeah. If you do have marketing budget, HubSpot and Marketo are They are and yeah, great. Yeah. They have free CRM at HubSpot, yeah, now, uh, which is which is really cool. Yeah. I mean, they have great content. If you haven't subscribed to the HubSpot content, do it. It's yeah. great, great content. I, that's one that I read all the time. What about constant contacts? I haven't used them very much, but I I, I would be surprised if they don't have personalization. They yeah. have personalization. I was thinking, like, is there anything beyond just like plugging someone's name? There, I'm trying to remember. There's a yeah. lot of a kind of behavior. Yeah. Behavior. Yeah. Behavior. Yeah. Predictive and behavioral. Yeah. So, I mean, there's predictive now. Predictive marketing and predictive analytics that is way spendy, as we say here in Portland. Um, it's usually enterprise level because they're they're doing they're they're mashing up your your analytics, right. all of it, and then, and then and then telling you what we think this guy's going to do. Um, but but short of that, really, marketing automation. Segmentation is the is the key word that I'm seeing right now showing yeah. up. Yeah, and the predictive will be it's very 2020. <laughs> it all it, it'll, it'll always be. I'm predicting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all so much.